2020 is upon us, and I'm sure that it is going to be a wonderful year. I'm claiming that. Now, it may not feel like the turn of a decade, but I think for all of us, we know that this is a, a very important moment. As things we've heard continuously about this virus is the need for us to curtail our movements, to stay close to home, and to be very intentional about washing our hands and being careful about uh, the interactions we have. Montgomery College was so willing to work with us and it absolutely was seamless. We did not miss a beat. Employees still felt engaged. students to be engaged with what's going on virtually at the college, but most important, be engaged with their professor. That is the number one communication connection that our students can get. Let me just say to you, see color. I think this is the opportunity, uh, maybe of the lifetime that I've been doing all of this work um, and bringing my experience to have these courageous conversations with our community. Look at the situation that we're in in America right now with 2.3 million people in prison and ask yourself, how safe do you feel? have an election coming up and I think have the opportunity to let the government know uh, what kind of immigration policies we would prefer. Look, we get it. 2020 has thrown a lot our way. 
But voting is something you can do. Your informed ability to help people stay engaged, uh, your commitment to that uh, makes my heart happy and it makes me so proud uh, that you are Montgomery College uh, students and you are actively engaged in the communities in which you live. Graduating class of 2020. We are doing this together. And together, we will see better days. Keep your head up, keep moving forward. We're gonna get through this. We're praying a lot, we are playing a lot, and I've even picked up an old hobby of mine. So uh, stay MC strong, everybody. We have already proven that working, teaching, and learning can be done remotely. I look forward to the time when we're all together as a college campus. Until then, be well and stay healthy. Hello colleagues, I wanna say welcome to 2021. And I think we all breathed a sigh of relief when 2020 was ushered out. I was hoping that it would sweep out all the bad as it left. Now, I know that was a little bit of magical thinking on my part, but it helped me get through the holidays. And I guess we all need a little hope these days as we continue to live in this moment. I'm recording this message on January 12th, and many political dynamics are still in flux just a few days after the appalling violence at the U.S. Capitol. I convey some of my feelings about the incident and a message to our community the day afterwards. We will continue to have conversations about what those tragedies mean in the near and long term. But it has been a wake up call for many of us about how fragile our democracy is. We're fortunate in the higher education space to have tools to improve how we understand political events and to have terrific experts among us. I expect we will rely on them heavily this year. Now, as we enter this new semester in the shadow of the pandemic and the elections, I wanna highlight some of the strengths that have emerged in the college in response. In the less than a year, we have faced the ravages of COVID and of police violence while living in constant divisive political rhetoric. Despite all of this, I've heard so many stories about teamwork and grit and self-sacrifice at Montgomery College that I can't even begin to count them anymore. When it came to protecting students and employees, there have been extraordinary efforts in every corner of this institution. When people in the community needed food packages or blood drives or voting information, our people stepped up under conditions that could have justified cancellations. When undocumented students were cut out of CARES money, people scrambled to support them. When basic needs were unfulfilled, new donors contacted Montgomery College's foundation, and when students disappeared from classes or didn't re-register, thousands of phone calls were made late in the evenings oftentimes. When many of us felt and were left overwhelmed by remote instruction at the start of the pandemic, people dug deep and trained those who needed help. When our students needed comfort and reassurance, counselors and advisors and our faculty stepped up in so many ways. And through it all, public safety and security continued to be present on our campuses so that the rest of us didn't have to be. They kept our facilities running, handed out IT equipment, office supplies and desk chairs, and diligently kept records of comings and goings so that contact tracing could be conducted. This is service that was not just professional, it was personal. The care that people showed for their colleagues was exceptional. Now this has been a period when lowering standards a bit might've been justified. 
Instead, academics and student affairs expanded their offerings, providing students with more flexible support and increased resources. This meant extra stress in a chaotic time, but it was instinctual for people at the college and it just kicked in. A great example is our nursing program where students pass rate on their licensure exam was 92%, the highest in 10 years. That was the, in the middle of a national emergency when some of them were preparing to work in overcrowded hospitals. When students excel in a crisis, you know something very special is happening behind the scenes. The deep commitment of our faculty and staff in these times could not be more apparent. Some very real sacrifices were made in sleep and in family time and relaxation and exercise. And I know there are stories like these nursing students and thousands of, of our voices across the college community and dozens of academic areas. And I hear them regularly from our students about how grateful they are for this level of dedication. That said, I know that remote work can be very challenging. I have my own challenges with it, but we muscled through it and got it done because we knew how much it mattered this year. Uh, normally in this speech, I would reflect on our year and talk about the progress of certain initiatives and those that still matter. And I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But while these efforts mattered so much this year, I wanna, I wanna highlight that. The college has always worked to prepare students for opportunity, but this year we were also doing other essential work as well. Helping people stay safe from COVID, getting folks food or masks or laptops, and many of us were listening to people who are isolated or grieving. These efforts have paid immeasurable dividends. Now, many of us have learned more about our students in the last year than we have in decades of in-person instruction. And that's because we were closer to their needs. Uh, we learned some things about our students' lived realities that weren't necessarily at the top of our minds. How many work or care for family members or do not have legal status? And from where I sit, where I sit, those are powerful insights that will drive our student success strategies well into the future. We've gotten a closer look at how much need there is out there and how vulnerable many of our students are. It has helped many of us understand why guided pathways really do matter or how class scheduling really can serve students better. Now this year was also remarkable because of the national tragedies we endured together. On top of new teaching strategies during the pandemic, we were helping folks walk through the pain of police violence, divisive political rhetoric, xenophobia, and most recently, assaults on our democracy. Making meaning of these realities for our students and guiding them through their emotions has been taxing. Shaping responsible citizens while our democratic norms were ruptured has been intense. And then, we would have to get up the next day and face the strain of the pandemic again. It has been an exhausting year like no other in my professional life, but it has made me even more grateful for my colleagues and for the chances we have to make direct impacts on the lives of our students. Now, as the economy contracts, preparing people for jobs in the new workforce will be critical. We will need more people in fields like healthcare, biomedical research, clinical trials, engineering, teaching, IT, and so many more areas. We'll also need professions, new ones for workers in areas that may not rebound, at least in the short run. And not all of our students are going to be equally prepared for these academic challenges. So we need more attention to the achievement gap so that it does not widen. We will also need guides and leaders for the new world we're stepping into. Tomorrow's presidential inauguration is a new chapter in some ways, but the schisms that were revealed during the election run deep. How do we rebuild our communities in this wake? How do we root out inequality that is already built into our social and economic structures? And how do we strip out the bias and the hatred that some folks are just discovering in our communities. Now, these are still open questions for our nation and for the college as well. 
but we are lucky that we're further along in the road of addressing many of them compared to some other institutions. Social justice has been at the core of our values for years now, and we will continue to host tough conversations about inequality and diverse communities, just as we have been doing for the last few years. When I think about how complicated this context is, I want to talk about three trends that I've noticed this fall, which I think will continue to matter in this semester. Acceleration, collaboration, and navigation. The first is acceleration. Some initiatives at the college have gained ground with remarkable speed recently. Some truly leapfrog moments have emerged during this crisis and catapulted us over barriers. Strategic enrollment management, for example, which is happening because of the urgency of the pandemic. Now, during extended winter session, we filled 82% of the seats for more than 3,000 credit hours about 1,000 more than the two 2019 winter sessions combined. Faculty and staff adaptation to new scheduling needs has been rapid and productive. The digital transition of academics and counseling and advising has taken place at warp speed. And I'm grateful to Elite and IT for spearheading the technical aspects of that momentum. We all owe a debt of gratitude to faculty who tutored each other so that our core function, teaching, could continue virtually. Technology changes have created a new steep learning curve for some, but they have been transformational and empowering to many faculty. This is a direction the college was moving in before the pandemic, so we got a boost of acceleration there. We even hosted a tremendous virtual commencement, which some viewers thought was even more personal than the traditional face-to-face -face ceremony. Speaking of which, the continuing COVID conditions mean that our commencement this spring will be virtual again. Although we know the vaccine is out there, it is hard to say how quickly it will be distributed and administered. So we have to continue to make health our top priority. Also accelerated this year has been our connection to business and industry. The college has always done this, but because the contraction of employment is hitting our students so hard, we've had to lean in there as well. The number of jobs out there is diminishing, so we've had to give students all the hiring advantages that we can, and in some cases, train them for entirely new uh, fields. A number of our senior leaders now serve on county economic recovery task force and committees, engaging closely with the college on workforce needs. These are already producing new opportunities, such as the biotech boot camp, which is going on right now. Student admission and registration processes have accelerated with help from Start Smart approaches. And some of these were already in process, but they've gotten a shot in the arm. Our access mission was reinvigorated by the pandemic with newly accelerated steps like waiving fees for applications, offering alternative placement and testing experiences, mailing laboratory supplies to students for lab classes. Now, if that's not innovation and innovative pedagogy, I don't know what is. Now, hours for tutoring and for library services were expanded this year to ensure that the achievement gap did not grow. And counseling and program advising activity launched in remote spaces as well. Conversations about equity and inclusion exploded all of them virtual. Attention to student and employee mental health increased as an attention to the experiences of remote workers. In many ways, people started to matter even more. And from where I sit, all of this is a powerful reorientation of our work. Leaning into the work that was already going to take place anyway means that we're taking advantage of the urgency and momentum that exist. Now, I realize the downside of acceleration is that we have to keep up a breakneck pace through the summer and fall, and the demand doesn't seem to be ebbing. And I hope that most of us are developing some skills around self-care, pacing, and compartmentalizing work and home life. Many of us didn't have those skills at the start of the pandemic, so we all sprinted into the crisis and never slowed down. Now we have a little bit more experience under our belts, 
And I want to thank HR STEM and Student Affairs for helping us to recognize this risk and creating a number of new resources to mitigate it. Exercise classes, mental health supports, and other virtual activities are helping us all stay active and connected. And I hope that the winter break gave us all a brief respite from the stress. Now, I know that it did for me, but I still have to meditate and exercise each day to keep that zen and to keep my focus. So as we step into our second full semester of remote teaching and learning, that acceleration will still be there. There is no doubt about that. But we'll also have to collaborate even more. Paradoxically, our growth this year has also revealed some gaps which need filling, perhaps more urgently now. Our responsibilities have expanded so much further beyond our campuses that everything we touch has implications for other groups of people. I notice this in my own work as well. I meet with county leaders more often, quite a bit, and I serve on several recovery task force. I confer with other college presidents sometimes daily, and our shared vulnerability in this pandemic means that none of us has the luxury of working in isolation. The upside is that we can have a greater impact on others in spaces like racial justice and educational opportunity. The point is that we're going to need to lean into this semester on collaborative approaches. Now, one of my virtual mentors, Brene Brown, says that when there is a new growth, like the kind that comes with collaboration, there will be mistakes, no doubt. And that's okay. That's inherent in doing something for the first time. So let's all own the vulnerability that comes with working more closely with others and take the chances that we need to do. Now, I was reminded of this by a friend of mine who shared this sentiment that was written by Neil Gaiman. I hope that in this year to come, you make mistakes because if you're making mistakes, then you're making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing the world. You're doing things you've never done before. And more importantly, you're doing something. So that's my wish for you and all of us and my wish for myself. Make new mistakes. Make glorious, amazing mistakes. Make mistakes nobody's ever made before. Don't freeze. Don't stop. Don't worry that it isn't good enough or it isn't perfect, whatever it is art or love or work or family or life, whatever it is you're doing, do it. Make your mistakes next year and forever. Now with that in mind, here are some spaces where I envision more growth at the college. Serving our students who don't have technology during the pandemic is a challenge we have not entirely solved. Uh, IT services and Montgomery College Foundation did some terrific work there with the tools that they had on March 20th, and they hustled and they worked so hard. But a systematic approach to this issue is really essential if we're going to serve everyone in the long run. Collaboration is critical there. Now, if our mission is true access, even during a pandemic, we'll need some more engagement in this space. Lowering barriers to students' entrance to the college is even more vital now in a remote environment. The Student Success Network continues to work intensely on this. Now, partnerships are critical there because the student experience is spread across multiple service areas within the organization. We have to lean out of our comfort zones to stretch our work in scheduling, start smart, guided pathways, and comprehensive advising. Now, here's another lesson we've learned. In our new virtual world, we're only as strong as our weakest digital connection. That goes for keeping students enrolled and making employee processes efficient. Workday is making great strides in this area, and an IT master plan is collecting feedback. Any of you who have roles in this work know how much collaboration matters in these spaces. Comprehensive advising is another of our ATD goals that relies on partnerships. We're going to have to build consensus on digital strategies and communication across all of our advising efforts this spring. And I'm going to go back to our existing advising team and ask them to go deeper 
on this issue in order to clarify roles, processes, and technology in order to build stronger, richer connections to our students by every member of the college community. After listening and speaking with counselors, program advisors, faculty, students, and others, I am gonna be charging this group to ease institutional and academic wayfinding for our students, enhance student connections to the college, and decrease time to uh, accelerate our completion efforts so that we can increase credential completion by all of our students. Data governance is another area where some strategic change is happening to ensure that data is accessible in constant and consistent formats and that we're using it in the most meaningful ways possible. Now, this is a highly collaborative venture. When the economy contracts, the pressure to quantify our value is even more intense. Getting this right means that many heads are necessary in the game, but the result will be data that can be used more quickly and productively in even more areas. Now that brings us to budgeting. <clears throat> Managing our budget in ways that advance our shared mission and values is critical. It's essential work. The strategies we've designed to protect jobs with the hiring fee freeze, a talent share, and strategic enrollment management are inherently collaborative. Now, our final area where collaboration will be crucial is in understanding employee needs. The newly renamed Employee Experience and Culture Survey will take place this semester, and a strategic workforce analysis is on the horizon. This is a great time for us, and it's also one of great flux as we experience our work. It has changed fundamentally and more quickly than any of us could have imagined. Building the structures that support our new work lives has to be a joint effort, and we've seen some extraordinary collaborations on that front this year. Now, on that note, I want to say something about what got us through this last year. And I think I speak for a lot of us when I say that the college community has become even more important over the last 10 months. I would help many of us, myself included, was sharing my own struggles and listening to others. It was relationship rich, as my colleague, Dr. Monica Brown likes to say. We visited our kitchens and living rooms with children and animals climbing into Zoom shots. There was noise from construction and leaf blowers interrupting calls. We learned who works late so they can help a parent or spouse during the day. We found out who has a repair person coming and for which appliance. We learned more about the joys of colleagues, children and grandchildren, and sometimes more about the sorrows of illnesses and losses. We learned more about each other because we had to. We leaned on each other. That muscle that we've built this past year, we are going to need it this spring as well. The crisis is not over, my friends. It has only become normalized in a way. We think about how this has affected our emotions as workers over the last year. And I wanna point out a bit of research on disaster workers, which I think we all can relate to. There is a complex series of emotions that we all pass through sometimes at different speeds, and they're normal responses to abnormal conditions, but they affect how people work. Let's keep that in mind when we engage with colleagues and students who may be struggling in ways that we're just simply not aware of. The vulnerability that we face this year goes beyond individual emotions to institutional health, even as the vaccines roll out and we start to anticipate the new normal of the post-COVID world, we will face new challenges fiscally, like in FY22 and beyond, which will require our best thinking, planning, and collaboration. Our senior vice presidents are going to direct this work as we implement our strategic plan in the midst of some increasing fiscal constraints and potentially more regulation when the new administration comes into office in Washington. And while it may seem daunting, our successful collaborations this last year should give us even more confidence as an institution. What I witnessed this year in our classrooms, our living rooms, our dining rooms, shows me that we have what it takes. In fact, 
many of us have more than we thought we had. Now in the coming semester, we will have to navigate some new conditions. The vaccine rollout will hopefully improve safety, but not immediately. There will likely be a hybrid scenario which we'll have to adapt to on multiple fronts. Academics, HR, STEM, and student affairs will encounter conditions that are uncharted for so many of us. We'll have to remain flexible and collaborate deeply to make thoughtful strategic decisions. And we have to continue adjusting our curricula to a changing employment picture in the county and the state as new industries grow, like biotech and research, and others evolve, like hospitality and the K-12 education sector. There will likely be changes in our funding that will trickle down to us in an unpredictable manner. And as we process these changing expectations, we'll need to be nimble to respond optimally. We'll need to collaborate closely to decide which investments best serve our mission writ large. And we'll need to continue to plan strategically for sustainable finances. We'll be navigating some new national trends in politics, which are unpredictable at this stage. But we expect one bright light to be the new Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, who, if confirmed, has a vision for opportunity and equality in education that appears similar to our own. In his words, quote, for far too long, we've allowed students to graduate from high school without any idea of how to meaningfully engage in the workforce while good paying, high skilled technical and trade jobs go unfilled. I'm hopeful to hear of his values, but as always, it means change, more of it. It is promising that the new presidential administration will likely be more welcoming of immigrants and strengthen opportunities for DACA. On the whole, our nation will still have to navigate the unresolved tensions of the election and schisms created by the unequal impact of the pandemic on our communities. With strong national leadership, however, we can begin to work through these and move forward with a new motion and notion of diversity and equality as a public good. If anything, COVID has taught us that our nation, how interconnected we all are. And we must in fact rely on each other to rebuild our economy and our society in ways that protect individual physical health as well as the health of our democracy. And as we embark on this new semester, I wanna encourage you to lead from where you are. Take chances, make mistakes, try new approaches, lean into some fear that you have. We can grow as an institution as more of us do that personal work personally and imperfectly. To faculty whose world-class instruction continued during circumstances we couldn't have imagined a year ago, you are my heroes. And to our staff at all divisions who have grown and shown ingenuity and flexibility in remaking the college's virtual environment, you are talented, diligent colleagues with boundless hearts. And to administrators who are navigating and building the new higher ed landscape, I'm inspired by your energy and your innovation. And to students, you are examples to all of us enduring hardship and isolation, but continuing to achieve. The college is committed to supporting you through these times so that you can emerge stronger and better prepared for the next chapter of your journey. Thank you all. Have a resilient semester. Now I'm gonna turn this over to our Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Sanjay Rai, followed by the Senior Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Monica Brown. I'm Dr. Sanjay Rai, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I'm so pleased to be here this morning with you. I will try to be brief, but I have heard so much about our amazing faculty and the staff that it may be impossible. It should be said over and over again, Montgomery College faculty and staff have risen to the challenge of teaching and learning in this COVID environment and all deserve our acknowledgement for transitioning to emergency remote, to restructure remote teaching, training, and adopting course materials to addressing 
student needs. I want to thank them all for their efforts. I have heard about the lab kits that have been sent home to students so they don't lose the hands-on experience. The remote environment inspired creativity in teaching as well, including a faculty member who painted her garage wall in chalkboard paint, and a lesson about the speed of light that involved microwaving marshmallows. Sometimes the families of students benefited as well from those who ate the delicious meals prepared by hospitality management students to the friends and family members who were treated to practice at home sonograms. I would like especially to recognize the work of lab staff at all campuses who assisted with the technical aspects of remote instruction. Likewise, I am so grateful, so grateful to the library and learning center staff, tutors and academic coaches, department and program staff members, and all faculty members who work tirelessly to ensure that the students received a consistent, high quality and rigorous academic experience during this extraordinary semester. Your students appreciate you, your colleagues appreciate you, your chairs, deans, provosts, and senior leadership, we all appreciate you. The events of the past six months have confirmed what we at Montgomery College already know, that education's responsibility to society is to confront the issues of racism and social injustice. In addition, we have also experienced the promises of a digital economy, as well as the challenges of the digital divide. When we emerge from this pandemic, our world will have changed and we will have much to look forward to and much work to be done. I'm looking forward to seeing how we will continue to adapt to and succeed in a new environment. Once again, I thank you, faculty and staff, for all that you do and have done to support our students. And I wish you a very, very successful spring 2021 semester. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Monica Brown, the Senior Vice President for Student Affairs and welcome to the spring semester. We in Student Affairs have adapted our services to ensure that students continue to receive support for their success, well-being, and obtainment of their educational goals in this remote environment. We have explored and implemented creative, innovative, and effective student success practices, and I am incredibly proud and appreciative of what the faculty and staff have accomplished. Let me highlight just a few. College-wide counseling and advising transitioned all in-person services to a centralized remote operation by developing and implementing a new online chatbot, expanding their live chat feature, launching a virtual student waiting room, and creating a remote front desk. Financial aid appointments, workshops, and assistance with FAFSAs and forms were conducted via Zoom. All required financial aid forms are processed now using a newly introduced electronic form submission. The Financial Aid Office also rushed Federal CARES funds to more than 8,000 students this spring, summer, and fall totaling over $5 million. Raptor Central saw a 714% increase in emails and phone contact rose by 82% over last year. Records and registration saw an increase of 44% in the use of the online transcript service and a 472% increase 
in the number of students reactivating their MC accounts. Recruitment and assessment centers shifted their communication modes to provide Zoom webinars to help students navigate new procedures, including remote placement testing and submitting transcripts. Student Employment Services partnered with the U.S. Office of Personnel Management to host a series of online job search workshops. Also, Student Employment Services hosted a virtual federal job fair that included 49 federal agencies. More than 600 students from Montgomery College and neighboring institutions attended the workshops and job fair. The Student Health and Wellness Center for Success instituted support groups for students, in addition to a soft launch of its new social resource program, thanks to a $75,000 grant donation from Lockheed Martin for emergency support for students during the pandemic, and so much more. I want to thank all of Student Affairs for their tremendous work and adaptation to this remote work environment. We remain MC proud, MC strong, and MC resilient. Now, let's take a look at a few outstanding examples of faculty and staff contributions captured by the elite department, highlighting how they remain MC proud, MC strong, and most of all, MC Resilient. When we first heard that we were going remote, uh, it, took me, it took me a while for it to really sink in. I thought, no, I'll still be able to teach my class in person, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not gonna happen in, until after I teach my summer two class. Well, no, I was wrong. Uh, so jumping into that first summer two class was really hard. I wasn't very familiar with Zoom, other than the show I remember when I was growing up. Uh, I used Blackboard, but not a lot in my class. And I was really nervous about how to, how to teach in an environment that I'm usually a very active instructor, walking around, breaking students into groups, having snacks, I chat with them before and after class. So I just wasn't sure how I was going to do that. How was it going to work? I remember thinking very quickly that um, when I was told we're going to do SRT training, my first thought was, OMG, SRT ASAP. <laughs> it was going to take so long to do, yet I realized pretty quickly there was going to be a lot of support for it. We transitioned to teaching remotely in the spring. I was terrified. I was terrified of the technology and um, I had a lot of anxiety but I'm pleased to say I've come out on the other side stronger and uh, better for it. Certainly being a nurse and working in all kinds of clinical settings, ICU, CCU, whatever, um, you learn to set priorities and you learn that you have to kind of um, recognize when you're uh, feeling threatened or upset and a feeling is just a feeling and then you just have to jump in and do it. And I realized that I have to assist these students down this path, which means that I have to lead them and I have to conquer my um, insecurities and whatever doing that. And um, in the beginning, um, you know, we used to say in nursing school, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I was faking it a bit, but now I feel very comfortable with it. I feel more resilient because during the eight months, I um, almost continually faced challenges uh, related to different aspects of my teaching. And um, with hard work um, and with significant support, I was able to overcome them. And this uh, makes me feel more resilient. I can say with confidence that the learning centers operated with the highest level of intention and strength that I have seen while at MC. I've become a more resilient manager through this learning process 
because I have learned that it's okay not to be perfect. And I've learned that to some degree, I had to let go because there were many things that were out of my control, like my Wi-Fi connection. When I reflect on all the work that's been done over the past 10 months, I'm in awe. The members of our team have made leaps and bounds when it comes to pedagogy and technology, and it excites me to think about what the future holds. Virtual tutoring may not be the perfect solution for all, but I'm extremely proud of how far we've come and advanced in the last one year and how we've been able to serve our students despite every obstacle. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I want to thank Dr. Pollard, Dr. Rye, Dr. Brown, and Elite for sharing these inspiring updates and examples of MC's extraordinary efforts to provide the highest quality teaching and learning amid the myriad challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I also want to express my gratitude for all the hard work all of you have put in since last March. We don't say this enough, but I again want to say thank you. Now, one thing that stands out for me about all of these efforts is the agility with which we responded quickly to the needs of our faculty, to our staff, and our students. What, astonish, what is most astonishing about all of this is that most colleges and universities are, let's say, notorious uh, about their resistance to change and to new ways of doing things, like revamping the academic calendar, employing new and unfamiliar technology, often overnight, creating offices at home, and working with students and colleagues who appear in little boxes on our screen devices rather than in our classrooms and our offices. Now, granted, many of these solutions are not perfect, but we must not lose sight of the idea that agility and change are good things and that need to be part of MC's culture moving forward. NC ought to be notorious for our agility. It makes us MC strong, MC resilient, and MC proud. Thank you. Now, just a couple of announcements about Professional Week before we adjourn. So first, the AAUP, AFSCME, and SEIU remote meetings all begin at 11.15 this morning. I know you'll do good work in those meetings. Our robust Professional Week schedule can be found on the Spring Opening Meeting webpage. And please be sure to note that we built the schedule to provide time for everyone to watch the presidential inauguration ceremonies on Wednesday. Have a great spring semester and take care.